Hey, my name's Ivan Connerman. I am a layout boat hunter. I have hunted out of layout boats for almost 20 years. And my goal with this video is to make something that's really focused on safety around layout boat hunting. There's lots of videos out there that show you what it's like to, to smack birds and get birds in the decoys and, and set out a layout. And the goal with this was to help focus on safety. Um, I've learned a lot in, in that time from certainly mistakes that I've made, things others have done uh, have been really big indicators for me of, hey, here's some things to do or here's some things to not do. I was also really lucky in my last job that I got to work with the Coast Guard Search and Rescue Program. So in that role, I took advantage and asked them, hey, here's some things that I'm doing. What else would you do or what's really helpful or, or how do you search for people if that does come up? So I've, I've learned a lot in that and I'm, I'm hoping to, my goal is to roll that into this program. I also wanna make sure it's clear, when you're layout boat hunting by definition, you're in big waters, you've got lines all over the place, you've got people with guns, you have folks who a lot of times are tired and they're, and they're pushing through it. You often have wind and sea conditions that can, that can be pretty extreme. This isn't gonna cover your ass completely. So I wanna make sure we're, we're, I'm really honest with you that this may be some good information it's up to you to know how to take this, how to utilize it, and how to make sure that this works for you, your crew, and the places that you're going. All right, with that said, let's jump in. All right, so safety with the layout boat starts actually well before you get out into the water. And so for the conversation today, uh, I've got a nifty diagram here. We got our wing, we got our, our layout boat, we got our tender, we got some decoys out here. The most important thing that you can do is to build competence with your boat, your setup, and doing all this well before the season. If you wait until opening day or until the first time out and you say, oh yeah, we're gonna go do this new layout boat hunting stuff, you're really setting yourself up for failure. And I will tell you, I, I practiced a good bit before I went out my first few times, and even then, it still was a cluster. So, being able to do this in daylight, being able to do this when it's warm, being able to do this in shallow enough water that you and buddies can get out and go, okay, let's, let's untangle this from the propeller, all that kind of stuff. Th that's absolutely essential. Knowing how to transfer somebody from the tender into the layout. Do that when it's warm. Do it when it's daylight. Do it when you're in gentle seas. Because the first time that you do this, you don't want it to be, it's really dark. The waves are bucking both boats independently and you got someone who's scared shitless because they've never done this and you haven't either. That's a bad spot to be in. So one of the things to keep in mind, and this is what I like to call the three-dimensional chess when I'm, when I'm running a layout boat, is a lot of times people see, oh yeah, I've got my tender, here's the layout, I come up to it, and I've got these decoys all over the place. And they think, oh yeah, I want to stay away from this. Here's what you've really got. Here's the minefield you're actually working through. You have an upwind anchor, you have a downwind anchor, you have the upwind anchors here that come out from various places. And these may not be straight, these may be at different angles. You've got the downwind anchors, upwind anchors. So there's, there's all these anchor lines all over the place in addition to the anchor or to the main line between your decoys. So you want to, as you drive your boat, be really clear about, okay, if this is my motor, how do I keep this spot clear of all of these other things. A lot of times people get really focused about not driving the boat on twines. Good. Here's a little secret. You can actually get the front half of the tender over a line and it's not a big deal. Remember, if there's nothing happening underneath here, assuming your hull is smooth on the bottom, you don't have something to snag, that's no big deal if a, if a line gets underneath the tender for the first half or even two thirds of the boat. You also can have lines get relatively close to the back as long as you're aware of what you're doing. There's no substitute. I will not be able to draw enough graphs or diagrams or talk this into simplicity for you. It's going to take skill. It's going to take something for you to learn how to do, for you to get used to. Period. Full stop. Now one thing you can do to make this much easier on yourself, and you notice how I have this diagram set up, is you'll, uh, got my cord tangled, you'll, uh, You'll do better if you back into the wind. A lot of boat drivers are not comfortable backing their vessels into the wind. That's particularly true for duck hunters with small boats. When you look at bigger yacht owners, they are often far more confident 
backing that vessel into a slip than they are anything else. And the reason for it is because you actually have much more control when you back into the wind. Here's the analogy I like to give. If you think of the wind, substitute the wind for gravity. Obviously, gravity only works this way. So if I was to hold this marker right here, gravity is going to have it always point straight down. In this case, gravity and the wind are basically doing the same thing. So my fingers are acting like the boat motor. This is the force counteracting gravity. Or my motor is the force counteracting the wind and keeping my tender where I want it to be. So that, that's the first thing to think about. The second thing to think about, and this is a little bit of a mind bender for folks, is don't just think about pushing the boat forward. Yeah, that, that is what you're doing. What you also can do is you can use that motor to pull the motor in one direction or pull the motor in the other direction. You're probably realizing, oh yeah, I've got that steering wheel. How, how do I do this quickly? Well, the number one thing you can do is put one of those steering knobs on your wheel so that when you shift from forward all the way to the right to reverse all the way to the left, you can crab walk the boat by pushing this way and pulling this way and pushing this way and pulling this way. You can walk that boat sideways and what will happen is the wind will continue to push the bow directly downwind. Again, this is something that you, you really want to practice. You will do great if you can set up some buoys or cones or use a pier or even, I use a bridge when I go out in the summertime and I will do backing drills up to a bridge just to keep myself sharp. So play with that and, uh, and, and you'll get really, really far. So now let's talk about float plans. This is the second thing you can do before you even leave home. What is a float plan? In a nutshell, a float plan is, simple, is simply essential information that you want to leave with somebody so that if there's an emergency and the Coast Guard calls and they can't get a hold of you, they can talk to that person and have all the information that, that they want. The other thing that's essential about a float plan is you're giving it to the responsible person. Maybe it's your spouse or a family member or just a really good friend who you know has got their shit together. And you're also telling them, hey, we're going to be launching from this place. We're going to go hunt over here. Uh, a backup place we're going to go hunt is over there. I will call you by 2 p.m. and give you an update. If I haven't called you by 2 p.m., something is wrong, you start to call me. And then you start to call the Coast Guard. You start to call the Sheriff's Office, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a really good way for you to have that information consolidated. I'm gonna throw up on the screen right now a picture of what a float plan looks like. You can see there's key information on there about the vessel, what kind of safety equipment you have, what the Coast Guard might want to know so that as they're looking for you, they know exactly what to look for. So your whole identification number, uh, they've got your call sign so they can call you on the radio, et cetera. One of the other things that's incredibly important to have, not just on the float plan, it's also on each person, is the list of who's on the trip. What's their age? What kind of allergies or medical conditions do they have? What kind of medicines are they on? If something happened and we called the Coast Guard, we called first responders, and because a crew member was hurt, I would want to make, I want to make sure that when I go talk to that EMT, because my buddy is, is having kind of a problem, I can be sure I let that EMT know, hey, this is my buddy John, he's on these medications, he's got this kind of condition. That way I'm doing everything I can to help them care for him the best way possible. And, and this is not a fun thing to consider, I also like to make sure I've got everybody's spouses or significant others' names and phone numbers. Now, that information I print out, I give everybody on our trip a copy of that, we fold it up and stick it in our wallet. It's a just in case we really, really want that information, we've got it. We're not working to remember it. We're not looking at it on our phone, which maybe we're at a cell signal. Who knows what the deal is? We've, we've got it the right when we want it. One other thing to include on the float plan for the person who's at home is the number of the nearest Coast Guard station. So one of the things I've done is I've gone through and pulled all the Coast Guard uh, command centers and have their numbers list it out, and then I just do is I take a, a, uh, a marker and I just circle the marker for where I'm going. These float plans are laminated. That's the part I didn't say first. So I just, on the, on the laminated piece, I'll just highlight the one that my wife can call in case, again, she doesn't hear from me or if there's some kind of a problem. All right, 
Next thing you can have before you go out is either an EPIRB or you can have a PLB. An EPIRB is an emergency positioning or position identifying radio beacon, personal locator beacon. So these do by and large the same thing. This one obviously a lot smaller, also a lot cheaper. Fits that nicely into a pocket in the life jacket. This a little bit bigger, usually these are ship mounted. I keep mine in my, uh, in my safety gear box along with flares and, and, and other things. The key part is if you are heading out, you wanna have all your safety gear. So I've got my, my flares, I've got a electronic flare, I've got flags, I've got all that stuff. The other thing is, it's not enough just to have an EPIRB or a PLB, you want to set it up. If you don't set it up, the Coast Guard doesn't know who the hell they're calling. They don't know if it's a, a, something that a kid was playing with, they accidentally set it off, they're just not sure. So do yourself a favor. This connects to the float plan I talked about a minute ago because when you register this, you want to make sure that the person who you put as a point of contact is the person who has your float plan because that's who the Coast Guard's are gonna call. So if you pop this out and say, I'm in deep shit, the Coast Guard's gonna call the number of whoever you have on there. You want that person to say, oh yeah, Ivan and his buddies took off from this place, they were hunting out here. That way the Coast Guard's gonna say, okay, this sounds legit. This person has taken steps to not only register this, they also have a float plan. We're a lot more confident we can search assets or we can send assets out to find this person much, much faster. So all the safety gear, absolutely important. One other thing to do to increase your safety is, this is a rule for me, I only run a body of water in the nighttime after I've run it in the daytime. One of the things I'm sure every one of you has seen is you're, you're moving through a body of water, maybe it's a creek or a, a river or even a big lake, and there's a fishing net. There's an old pier or a stump out there. There are who knows all kinds of things floating around in the water or just underneath the surface of the water. So I really like to know I've run this water, it's clean, I have a good GPS track that I can follow that I'm confident in. I won't be surprised by fish nets or lobster pots or something else that I didn't know was out here. So in addition to you being clear on what the safety procedures are, I also like to make sure I brief my crew. So I have a crew briefing that is actually laminated to the back of my float plan. I have two copies, one stays at home and one goes with me. The one that goes with me, I have the, the crew safety brief on. The one I leave at home, that's the one that has the Coast Guard numbers with it as well. So when I'm briefing my crew, I cover things like, hey, here's what's on everybody's life jacket. Here's what to do in an emergency. Here's the priority for us to, to think about if we do have an incident. If this happens, these are the steps to take. And I cover all of those things. So that way, if I'm the one who's disabled, if I'm the one who's out in the water, the crew knows what to do and how to act. So one other thing that, uh, that's important to know is those, uh, those kill switches on your motor, they're not there for nothing. I encourage you guys to use it. Uh, I certainly do. And what I do is because clipping it to my life jacket is a little bit of a pain because I've, oftentimes I want to step away from the wheel. What I do is I put it into a loop and I just stick my hand through it so that my throttle hand has got that safety strap on me. You'll want to have a backup safety strap because if you have the captain go into the water, how in the heck is a crew gonna come get you if they don't have this and they don't know where it is? So my recommendation is have one of these, have it on something nice and highly visible and then stick that right in the top of your safety box so that if you go in the water, they have a way to get to you. All right, let's go over a few more things on some safety related items when you're in the tender. So now this is just if you're in the tender at any time, driving out, et cetera. The number one thing is I require everyone to wear a life jacket if we're going over five miles an hour. That is a, is a, a rule we have on my boat. It makes it really simple so that if we're running to grab a bird, if we're gonna drive over and, and swap gunners out of the layout, we all know we're gonna life jacket up. It's not a question, it just makes it real, real simple. Now, every life jacket in my boat has a couple of things that are important. Number one is everyone has a light. The reason for this is if someone goes out of the boat and it's dark, we don't wanna be looking for them. So if they're, if they're able to, I tell them they have three responsibilities. First one is turn on this light. 
that's going to kick off the, the beacon. You can see that light's going right there. I'm going to turn that back off. The second thing that they have a job to do is to use a whistle. So not only can I see them, I can now hear them, and I know where they are as well. So if it's daytime, it just gives me a chance to know, hey, this is where they are as well. Another great way to home in on someone. The last responsibility everyone has is that when the throw bag gets thrown to them, you notice the throw bag has a hook on the bottom of it. What this hook is for is so that when that throw bag gets chucked to me, I'm in the water. If I'm cold, if I'm disoriented, if I'm a little freaked out, if I'm clutching a hold of that rope with my hands, that may not work. I may let go accidentally. I may just be so fatigued that I let go of the rope. So if I take that clip and run it through either one of these hooks, now the team on the, on the boat can just pull me into the tender and help me get back on board. So it's, a, it's an easy way to make sure that these critical safety items are, are there. One other small note is the whistles are out. I used to keep the whistles in a pocket and then I realized if somebody's hurt or if somebody's like, let's say their left arm is hurt and the whistle is in the right pocket, it could be hard for them to get at. So I just go ahead and leave these out all the time. All right, if there's only two people hunting, so one person in the tender and one person, one person in the tender, one person in the layout, then my rule is whoever's in the tender must have a life jacket on all the time. And the reason for that is if they take a leak, if they do whatever else and they go overboard, the life jacket just gives them a much better chance of getting back into the boat and, and then being able to clean themselves up, get dried off, and, and continue the hunt. Or call it a day. The, the key is they've got a lot better options with a life jacket on than they do without one. All right, next thing is because of all of these lines in the water, no matter how good of a boat driver you are, you will at some point wrap a line around a propeller. And when you do that, what you want to do is have a plan for how you're going to address it. And I will tell you the single best piece of equipment you can have for that is a boat hook. So notice that this boat hook not only has the little point to push things with, the really important part is that this has this uh, curved surface facing forward. So I can both grab a line and push it as well as grab a line and pull it. That's really what you're going for. When those lines get around the prop, it can be really difficult to untangle them if you don't have a way to both pull and push that. One other thing to do is to, to monitor the weather. And you're going to want to monitor the weather very, very frequently. My favorite is to use the VHF radio, run it to the, to the weather broadcast from NOAA, and make sure I listen to that every hour or so. The biggest thing to do when it comes to weather is don't ignore what's right in front of you. So if NOAA is calling for 10 to 15 knot winds, and you're experiencing 20 knot winds, and you realize this is bigger than what they're saying, and it's increasing, pack up and get the hell out. Don't die because the forecast didn't match what you had in front of you. So my rule is, would I still be here if the wind increased five miles an hour? And if the answer is no, then I usually start to pack up and move someplace else to hunt. It's just not worth it to do anything else. All right, when you're in the tender and you're back up watching the, the gunner in the layout. Remember your number one priority is this person's safety. They are anchored, they're not able to move. I have, this is a, this is a true story, I have been hunting out of a layout boat uh, in coastal waters in New Jersey and some guys were, father and son went out to test something on their boat, they were coming back in, neither one of them was watching where they were going. And I'm here I can't move, and here comes this really sizable boat. It looked like it was 35 feet or so, really sizable vessel, compared to the 10-foot stationary item I was in. And I, I start to panic, and I call my buddy on the radio, and luckily, he had seen it. He was already moving to, to interdict them. Speaking of radios, when you have a VHF, not all channels are channels for for, for you to utilize as a, as a recreational boater. The, the best channels for you to use to talk from the tender to the layout are 68, 69, 71, and 72. The other channels have different purposes. A lot of them you don't want to be on because you'll, you'll, you'll just be work, interfering with other people's work and traffic. So those are the four best channels. And that's not Ivan's recommendation. That comes straight from the Coast Guard and also from uh, the FCC, I believe. 
All right, so let's jump into the third section of this, which is focusing on transferring hunters from the tender into the layout boat. If at all possible, if you're the captain, your job is to drive the tender and nothing else. My preference is to always hunt with a crew of three, myself and two other people. What that means is if I'm driving the tender, someone else is obviously in the layout, the other person is going to, when we get close, they're going to take gear. They're going to help this person get out of the, the layout and into the tender. And then that person who just came out is going to turn around and help that second hunter get into the layout. So your job as captain is to watch this danger area between the tender and the layout. If someone were to fall, this is where they're most likely to fall. Remember, you've got an anchored boat here and you've got a probably 1,000 plus, 2,000 plus pound vessel here. And if someone gets in between us, it's gonna be really bad in addition to the fact that they're in cold water. So in addition to watching out for their safety, you're also keeping an eye on all of these lines. So I drew this a little more open. Some people bring the decoys in tight. It's just a way to remember that your job is really the safety of, of the overall operation and primarily keeping the tender exactly where you want it. One thing to remember is that when you get close to, to the layout, you can use your boat hook to pull it in up against the tender. That's gonna make it easier for folks to transfer back and forth. So when I pull up and I've got my hunter in the layout, and I've got my next hunter ready to go. What we do is I'll get right up against it and I'll have the guy who's about to get in, he will take the layout hunter's gun and he'll take their small bag. Now when we transfer guns, actions are open and then we also use a gun float and I'll put a picture of this up. The gun float is really just a big float that's capable of, of um, keeping a eight to nine pound gun off the bottom of the water and there's a little clip on the end so that I can clip it to the shotgun. Now when that comes aboard, oh yeah, and the actions are always open. We never transfer guns without the actions open. So when that comes aboard, then we'll get the other hunter in. So the first guy comes out of the layout boat. He's also got a, what we call a transfer PFD on. So it's a nice dark colored jacket. What we like about these is that it's easy to take off. It hasn't got all the other gear on it because hopefully it's only being utilized here. So once I get out of the, once I get in the layout, I'll take this off, fold it up and stick it down into the layout boat, usually between my legs. When I'm transferring between them, I put this on. So again, it's mandatory for this to be on when we're going either direction. You'll see this has got the same loops that the other life jackets have so that if someone goes in the water, they can clip themselves on and uh, to that rescue rope and get pulled back to the tender. All right, so how to transfer between these. There are lots of different vessels. Most folks will be using a flat boat or a common boat to use as a flat boat type with a, with a say 24, 26 inch side height. The best thing to do is to step over and to keep your weight low. So just think of it like getting into a canoe. Ten, uh, layouts are actually incredibly stable boats. They're very low to the water, they're very wide, so you have a lot of stable you have a lot of stability with that platform. The key though is you will feel more stable if you get in and immediately squat down or take a knee. What I like to do is also use, instead of using waders, I like to use bibs and uh, bib overalls and knee boots. What that does is when I'm moving from one to the other, if I hike up a leg real high or if I'm really stretching, that bib overall can slide over that boot, whereas it's much harder to do that with waders. So something to keep in mind, I find them also a lot more comfortable to hunt in all day long. All right, so now we're gonna jump into the last part uh, on, um, on safety in the layout itself. Oh, one other thing that's great about bibs and knee boots is if someone does go in the drink and they get back into the tender, you're not pulling all that water out of the, you're not pulling all that water out of the, the lake or the, the bay that you're in. So you're not filling up those bibs and then dragging that water out in addition to the hunter. That water will pass right through and you'll just have whatever water fits into the knee boots. All right, as you transfer between the tender and the layout, one thing to remember is that, and I got my little nifty, my little nifty toy boat here, is that when you think about the boats, moving, your tender is going to 
move this direction about its center of gravity. You may think, well, yeah, that's obvious. Here's the thing to know. If you transfer from the bow into the tender, the bow is likely the spot of the boat that's going to move the most. It's almost certainly the part of the boat that's going to move the most. Most boats are going to have the center of gravity between the midpoint and, and the stern. So this is 500, maybe 600 pounds worth of outboard you have back here. That is going to shift the weight, the center of gravity a lot towards the stern. So if you can get close to that, that way when the boat moves, you're not pitching with the boat, you're moving from the part of the tender that is, relatively speaking, the, the, the flattest or the one with the least amount of movement in it. To do that, having a man overboard plan, and this is a key thing to include in your safety briefing for your team members. So again, I talked about it a little bit before. Whoever goes in the water, they have three responsibilities. Turn on their light, blow their whistle, and when this bag gets thrown out, and if you've never used one of these bags, the key is you want to hold on. This may sound like this Captain Obvious moment, and you'd be surprised. Hold on to the rope and throw the bag. The reason you throw the bag is because the bag's got the weight, and this line will just play right out of it. That's also where your clip is on the bottom. So the key is don't throw it at the person. You want to throw it past the person so that you can pull it back to them or get it close enough that they can just grab the line and then they can fish it up, get this hook on them and connect it to the PFD. Once you pull the person back towards the boat, this is where depending on your vessel, you've, you've got different options. I have a boarding ladder on the back of my vessel and I leave the boarding ladder itself in the splash well. So if I was in the, if someone was in the water and we were pulling them back to the boat, I would grab the ladder, connect it to the stern uh, anchor point or attachment point. That way we can pull the person around. We've already killed the motor. I could have said that first. Kill the motor, pull the person around, have them crawl up that ladder, get into the back of the boat, and then we're going to be able to, to help them from there. I carry a number of things for, for a man overboard kit in addition to the tools we've just talked about to get someone back into the boat. I have a dry bag in the bow and some bow storage area that's got a complete change of clothes. I have a small camp stove. I also make a point every trip to make sure I've got some kind of hot water or hot cocoa, something like that, so that if someone does go into the drink, we can give them slowly some warmer water fluids to help them get their body heat back up. At the end of the day, if someone goes into the water and they look hypothermic, they're really not doing well, forget all of this bullshit. Pick your boat and get your buddy to safety. So this is where knowing where you launched from can be really important. You may have another team member or crew member call 911 and say, hey, we want an ambulance. We got somebody who's hypothermic. If it's that bad, if it's just a mild case, you can just drive them back, pop them in a vehicle, warm them up. And if there's spare clothes to wear and they want to go back out, great. They may decide, you guys go ahead and hunt. I'm just going to stay here in the warm vehicle for the rest of the day. However it works, the key thing is you want to have things that you have already thought about so that you're not faced with the situation and going, oh crap, what do we do now? That's not the situation you really want to be in. All right, part four. Now we're going to talk about safety when it comes to being in the layout boat itself. So once, we'll say Joe is our hunter, once Joe transfers and he gets into the layout, there's a couple things. He doesn't remove his life jacket until he sits down. What that does is it means that he is much less likely to fall out of a layout. And anyone who's been in a layout will tell you they're insanely stable. It would take some serious work to fall out of a layout if you're seated. So once he's seated, takes off his PFD. The next thing he's going to do is he's going to grab the radio that we keep in the layout. And by the way, we keep the radio and all the other gear tethered to the layout so that it doesn't fall in the water. Also so that we can tell people, well, it's tethered. If you find the rope, follow the rope and you'll get it. So Joe's going to grab the radio and he's going to give me a radio check on whichever one of those four channels that we're set to for this radio and also for the tender. One minor thing, I like to set the radio up and then I'll use the lock function on the keypad. What that does is it stops the radio from, from being changed if someone accidentally hits it with an elbow or a gun in the layout itself. Now people can grab it, they can get a hold of me immediately. 
I also let them know how to take the lock function off so that if something happens to the tender and now we're in trouble, well now this, the person in the layout can use their radio to call for help as well. Okay. Also, safety in the layout itself. One of the things besides the radio I like to have is just a simple orange flag on a stick. That's great for a couple of things. One is, in the example I gave before of another vessel coming, towards the layout, you can use that to get their attention. They may just see the ducks, or they may see just the decoys and think, oh, there's a bunch of ducks, let's go run those up and help some other hunter. Well, you wanna let them know, no, it's not just ducks, I'm, I'm in the middle of this. The other thing I like to use that orange flag for is if the person in the layout shoots a bird and I pull up in the tender, that's the best thing for them to point with. So, preferably, when they shoot a bird, they'll call me and say, hey, I got a bird down, it's, it's a, it's uh, on the front left side of the tender and it's just outside of the decoys 10 yards. So now I know to start looking in this area. If I get up there, the person in the layout can use that orange flag to point left or point right from where I am to help guide me in. I don't want them pointing their shotgun at me and I may not be able to see their arm at that distance. One other thing is when there has been a successful bird down or a bird has been successfully down, by the hunter in the, the layout, when the tender goes to get it, so we're talking out here somewhere or, or, or downwind, the best thing to do is to use a long handled scoop net. So there's no good reason to lean out of the tender to grab a bird. It, it's dangerous, especially if there's just two people in the tender, that's especially dangerous move. So what we've gone for is just using a scoop net to grab that bird up and then giving the guy in the, uh, in the layout a heads up on exactly what he shot. Very last thing on safety in the layout mode is if we set up at night and I run a highly experienced crew, I've got a lot of years doing this myself, so I'm confident setting up at night. There's a number of things that we will do to increase safety. Number one is we put a light on the bow of the tender. What that does is it makes sure that I'm not getting light reflecting back from all the people in, and, and items inside of the tender. I can really see what's in front of me. What we also do is we put reflective tape at key locations on the layout itself. This way, and I use red and green for the port and starboard side, I also will run a, uh, a yellow strip right on the back of the splash guard. That way I can see exactly where the layout boat is. What I've also started to do is run a light on the starboard side, and then I also have a light this is a small, looks um, like a chem light on the port side so that, again, as I move around, because if I'm over here laying out decoys and I look over, I'm not going to see that layout. Remember, it's designed to blend in and go away, and they do exceptionally well in the dark. So that green light and the red light help me know, ah, that's where the layout boat is. It just helps me stay clear on exactly where it is and where my spread is relative to that. So, I hope this has been a helpful video. I, I know it's long, parts of it maybe were a little dry and, and I apologize for that. Safety isn't always the sexiest thing in the world. I will tell you, it, it means a lot to me and I've had, I've had the experience of knowing people who have gone out and some of them almost didn't come back. Um, I've known folks whose boat has been swamped, they've ridden out on a Coast Guard helicopter. It's a big deal. And when they shared their story, I took it really seriously. I sat down with a piece of paper and a pen and I started making notes to, to learn from that experience. So I hope this helps you. Uh, if there's something I didn't cover, you want more information on, please leave a note in the comments and uh, be safe out there and have fun.